Chem 2212. This is the Williamson ether synthesis. So we're going to start out our reaction. First, we have to prep our basic solution. We have our 4-bromophenol, which is a light pink powder that we can see in the, the base of our beaker here. We've got 6.922 grams of this powder. We've also got 14.247 grams of our 25% KOH solution. This is approximately 12 milliliters. We're going to add these two together. We'll put in our stir bar and let them stir and dissolve over the course of several minutes while we get ready to put together our reaction vessel. So I'll go ahead and open up our beaker. I'm going to swivel my snorkel into place. That is a strong odor coming off of our 4 bromophenol, so you want to be very careful. We'll go ahead and pour in our KOH. So we've got our pink slash purple liquid. Stirring bar goes in. And we'll let that stir for a couple minutes to make sure our 4 bromophenol is good and dissolved. So our 4 bromophenol solution has finished dissolving. We're going to measure that out in just a second. We start with our TBAB. We're going to go ahead and set up our Teflon reflux vessel here that we're going to put into the microwave. We've measured out uh, a total of, let's look at our sheet here, 2.905 grams of our TBAB. This is our tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. So that's our white crystals right here on our weigh paper. We've also weighed out our unknown alkyl bromide. This is 3.024 grams. This is a liquid, of course, so we've got it in our graduated cylinder, so we'll add that into the vessel as well. And then we're going to take 8 milliliters of our 4 bromophenol solution in potassium hydroxide. So let's start adding these into our vessel. I'm going to take my TBAB, I'll fold my paper here. This is the, the inner sleeve of our microwave vessel. So that's adding our TBAB here. We've got our unknown. Our code is OJ23BR43N, and that's written on our data sheet. So that's going to be the unknown alkyl halide or alkyl bromide that we're going to be identifying. Go ahead and pour all of our alkyl bromide in. Okay. Now let's measure out. I'm going to keep my snorkel in place because of the strong odor of our solution here, but I'm going to measure out 8 milliliters of this solution. Move this just a little bit up. There we go. We'll use our pipette here and measure out our 8 milliliters. Once we're done adding this into the, uh, into the graduated cylinder and into our Teflon vessel, we'll go back and review our data sheet. All right, let's take a look. It's right at eight milliliters. Go ahead and take this over, pour this into our reaction vessel as well. So all of our ingredients have been added. We're going to take our Teflon plug here, and this is our thermal well. Since we're only using one vessel, this is going to be our, our ATC vessel. We're going to place our thermocouple 
down inside of this uh, thermal well so that we can monitor the temperature of the reaction. So we'll go ahead and put this in place. This will seal our Teflon vessel. Put it into our outer sleeve. We're going to wait to cap it off until we get it over to the microwave. So let's go get this set up to reflux. Before we move over to the microwave, let's take a look at our data sheet. We've got a lot written down in a very short period of time. So initially, we started out with 6.922 grams of our 4-bromophenol, and that was dissolved into 14.247 grams, approximately 12 milliliters of our 25% KOH. That was our initial mixture. But that's not the actual weights that we're going to be using for our reaction when we're doing our calculations. We took 8 milliliters of that solution, which represents 3.46 grams of our 4-bromophenol, so that's what we'll use for our actual calculations, and corresponds to roughly 7 point, or exactly 7.12 grams of our 25% potassium hydroxide solution. We weighed in 2.905 grams of our TBAB, and 3.024 grams of our unknown alkyl bromide. We recorded our unknown code. We also made an indication of the visual observation of our four bromophenol light pink crystals before they were dissolved into a light pink solution. So we'll head over to the microwave and get the reaction started. All right, so let's take a look at our microwave instrument. This is our flexi wave from Milestone. A couple of points of interest here. We have our control panel. This is where we're going to set the parameters for each experiment. We'll take a look at the interior of the unit. We have our temperature probe. This is a fiber optic temperature probe that's going to be inserted down into the reaction vessel so we can monitor the temperature. We have our rotor here. There are 25 spaces, 24 spaces on here that we can use for 24 individual reactions. Today we're just going to be using one, but we have the possibility of uh, running multiple experiments at the same time. This rotates through the interior cavity as the microwaves are heating the solution. Let's go take a look at our reaction vessels. The reaction vessel that we use inside of our microwave instrument is composed of two main parts. We have our inner, inner vessel, or inner sleeve, which is composed of Teflon. Our reagents go into our Teflon inner sleeve. This is microwave transparent, meaning that the microwaves will penetrate and heat only the solution and not the vessel itself. We plug the top of this vessel using our Teflon plug here. Now in each of our reactions, before we do that, we would place a stir bar so that we can stir the solution as it's heating. We then place our thermal well in. This thermal well has a hole in the top. That's where our temperature probe is inserted so we can monitor the temperature of the reaction. The completed inner sleeve is then placed inside of a safety shield. The safety shield has a cap. This cap has a venting hole on it. This Teflon wafer is placed on top of our Teflon inner sleeve. And then we screw down the top of our safety shield. And it's ready to be placed in the microwave. This is the reaction vessel that we set up earlier. We have all of our reagents already inside of our inner Teflon sleeve. The last thing that we need to add is our stirring bar. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'm doing it under the snorkel because there is quite an odor associated with this reaction. So I'll open it up, place in our stir bar, and reseal our inner sleeve here. I'm gonna take my Teflon wafer and the top of our safety shield, and we'll come over here to our FlexiWave unit. I'll place it into position number one and we're gonna go ahead and set up our temperature probe. I'm gonna place that Teflon wafer right on top of my reaction vessel. We have a pass-through hole on our cap, so I'm gonna place my temperature probe through the center, and then down into the thermal well. You see that okay? 
So down inside the thermal well in the center of our reaction vessel. I'll gently place that shield. It did pop up. I'll place that back in in just a moment. Once we've tightened that down, I'm going to go ahead and press that fiber optic into place so that it won't move. Make sure we're tightly sealed. We always aim our vent hole towards the outside of our carousel, so we'll vent to the outside of our instrument. And now I'm going to take the final piece of our rotor, set it in place. This is going to make sure that our vessel remains upright during the course of the reaction. All right, so everything is in place and ready for us to begin the reflux. We'll come over here to the control module. We're already set up for our Williamson ether synthesis. All of our parameters are in place. I'm gonna hit go. And we'll check back in once our reflux is finished. There's a camera placed on the interior of the microwave unit that allows us to see what's happening inside. There's our reaction vessel as it slowly rotates through the interior microwave cavity. This allows us to get even heating during the course of the reflux. So our microwave reflux is finished. We're going to go ahead and retrieve our vessel from the instrument. Take our brace off, set it aside. I'm going to carefully remove the fiber optic. Of course, we're taking that out of the thermal well at the center of our reaction vessel. Take this over to the hood and open it up. We always hold our vent hole. We aim that away from us just in case there is any pressure relief. What just fell out, of course, was our Teflon, uh, Teflon wafer. We'll go ahead and remove the inner sheath. We'll take this back to our workstation and begin the extraction. All right, so we have our reaction vessel, our Teflon vessel here, uh, brought back to the bench top. We've set up our separatory funnel. I've put a short stem funnel on the top. The reason I did that is because I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Teflon reaction vessel. I'm gonna set aside my thermal well here, and I'm gonna pour the contents of my vessel into my SEP funnel. And I'm using my short stem funnel as a way to capture my stirring bar. All right, so that's captured in the top there. Next up, we'll take 10 milliliters of our distilled water, or in this case, deionized water. Pour that into my reaction vessel. Swirl it around a little bit and pour it back through. Let that drain down. And in actuality, it looks like our stirring bar is blocking us a little bit. I'm going to get some forceps real quick. And I'll go ahead and pull that out. We'll set that aside as well. Okay, so we have our original reaction fluid. We have 10 mils of deionized water. Now we're going to go ahead and add in 10 milliliters of diethyl ether. I'll go ahead and cap my reaction vessel and set it aside here. Of course, we're doing all of this underneath the snorkel 
as you can see. Let's take our short stem funnel out, set it to the side, and let's go ahead and extract. Just as we've done in the past, we give it a shake, we vent it out and away from us towards the snorkel. Vent, and then a third shake, and a vent. Put it back in our ring clamp. And get ready to separate our layers. Now let's take a look at our distribution. So it's going to take it a little while to fully separate. We'll give it a moment. Once the layers have completely formed, we'll go through the process of separating our layers. So our layers have resolved. We've got our diethylitha layer and then we have our aqueous layer. So let's go ahead and separate these two out. I'm going to drain off my lower layer. Remembering that our reaction, our original reaction mixture was aqueous based. Okay, so that's my lower layer. And that's identified as our aqueous layer. So I've gone ahead and marked my tape here so I don't mix up any of my layers. I'm going to take my ether layer, drain that out into a separate clean flask, and set that aside. And I've marked that as ether. Now I'm going to combine my aqueous layer back into my separatory funnel with a second 10 mil portion of diethyl ether. Okay, so here's our diethyl ether. Put our stopper on and go through the extraction. Take our top of our separatory funnel off. And we'll let these layers separate once again. We'll keep the camera on them this time. What we're looking at here is little tiny droplets and bubbles that form in the ether layer. And as they clear, they're popping and releasing that aqueous layer. Uh, so we see a clear separation between the two. So the the, all right, so the interface between the two is clear. We can see our layer separation. So now we'll go back and drain off our aqueous layer, the lower layer, just as we did before. And remember, this is an extraction process. So the idea here is that we are extracting our final product out of our aqueous reaction mixture and into our organic diethyl ether layer. Okay, so our aqueous layer is now separated. We're going to combine the two ether layers. Now that we've combined our two portions of ether, we're going to pour it back into the separatory funnel and begin our potassium hydroxide extraction. We'll go ahead and measure out our potassium hydroxide solutions and continue from there. So the next step of our extraction is to extract our combined diethyl ether layers. We're going to go ahead and pour that into our sub funnel.
This is where our product is currently residing. Okay. And we're going to extract it three times with 15 mils each. So 15, three 15 mil portions of our 5% potassium hydroxide solution. So think about your starting materials and your product and ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of washing with this 5% potassium hydroxide? And remember, I use the term wash as opposed to extract. So we're washing with 5% potassium hydroxide. Let me go ahead and pour this into our separatory funnel. Set this aside. I'm going to go ahead and put my beaker here so I know that that's my ether beaker. And we'll go through our process here. Shake and vent three times. and then back into our ring clamp for separation. Take our stopper out. Our separation is almost immediate at this point. Now, our bottom layer is our aqueous layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and take our aqueous beaker from before. We're gonna drain out our aqueous layer. We'll set that aside again. We've got our ether layer still in our SEP funnel, so we're gonna add a second 15 mil portion of our 5% potassium hydroxide. This will be our second wash. So we'll set this over here. Put our stopper back in. Shake and vent. Shake and vent. And our third time. Take our stopper out. Bring our aqueous catch flask or our catch beaker back over. Drain off our lower layer. So once again, our aqueous layer has been drained off. One final 10 mil portion, or 15 mil portion, I'm sorry, of our 5% potassium hydroxide. Pour that in. Stopper in place. do our last wash. Okay, stop her out. Let's go ahead and drain off our aqueous layer first. Still separating out just a bit. There we go. All right, lower layer. All right, lower layer has been removed. I'm going to set this to the side again. Now we're not going to throw this out until we're done with our entire process. I'm gonna take my diethyl ether beaker from before and drain our ether layer into it. All 
right, so that's it for our extraction and wash. We've got our diethyl ether layer. We'll move on to the next step of our reaction. So the last stage of preparing our product before we go through our filtration process is to dry our diethyl ether layers. We know that we've got a little residual water in here just as we do for most of our extractions. So I'm gonna take sodium sulfate Take a small amount, the end of our spatula here, put that into our beaker, swirl it around. We can see that we've aggregated. Remember that when our powder sticks to the side of the flask, we've aggregated water in solution. So I'm going to put in a little bit more. Give this another swirl. Actually, it looks like the majority of that powder has also stuck to our flask or to our beaker. So we'll have to add a little bit more. What we're looking for, just like we have in the past, is free floating powder when we swirl. If you want to look down into the top of that, we can actually see that some of the powder is floating freely, so it looks like we've aggregated all the water in our solution. Okay. We're going to leave this to continue to dry for a few minutes as we get our column ready for the next purification step of our reaction. The next stage of our reaction is continued purification. We're going to be using a flash chromatography setup. This is an empty column. This is what it looks like before we set it up for our flash chromatography. What we do is we put a small plug of cotton in the bottom, a layer of sand, a plug of silica gel in the center, a couple of inches high. I'll show you one in just a second that's been filled. And then a final finishing layer of sand on top to keep everything level. We'll take a look at this column here. So we have our cotton plug. We've got our layer of sand on the bottom. We've got our silica gel layer here in the center. This is what's actually going to do the separating for us during our flash chromatography. And then we have our sand layer on top. So we'll be pipetting our solution in uh, very slowly into the top of our flash chromatography setup and allowing it to flow through the silica gel that will separate our product from any remaining byproducts or impurities, so that what we collect at the bottom of this column should just be methylene chloride, diethyl ether, and our product. So we're ready to set up our column. We have it clamped here to our ring stand inside the hood. Before we can put our product mixture on uh, onto the column for separation, we've got to wet the column using methylene chloride. We've got that here, so I'm gonna go ahead and add methylene chloride onto our column and let it drain through. This is gonna help pack the column down so that there are no spaces in between uh, the silica gel granules. run down the side of our column so I don't disturb the top layer of the column, our sand layer. And you should be able to see as the liquid starts to slowly make its way down through the silica gel.
should be a sufficient amount. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use our air hose in the hood to apply a little bit of pressure here. If we allow this to move through the column under gravity alone, it can take a considerable amount of time. But using our air hose to push it through, that will help us pack down the column close out any of the air pockets. I don't know if you can make those out. We see a couple of areas where the column is not packed tightly. We want to push those down and compact them so that we've got a nice uniform layer of silica for our product to drain through. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this air hose. Turn it on at a gentle setting. It doesn't have to be a lot. Put this into the top of our column. And you'll be able to see that solvent volume coming through at an increased rate. Now I'm not going to let my column go dry, so as my solvent volume got down towards the top of my sand, I took my air pressure off. I'm going to go ahead and pour this methylene chloride back into the top. And I'm going to pass it through the column one more time just to make sure everything's compacted. Alright, so we'll let that drip for a second or two. We'll prepare our solution and get ready to put our product in ether solution onto the column for separation. We place a pre-weighed 250 ml beaker underneath our column. I'm going to go ahead and draw up our diethyl ether solution into our pipette. And I'm going to add that onto the top of the column. This is our dried ether solution from the previous step. If we get a little bit of the drying agent into our pipette, that won't hurt anything. The drying agent will actually be trapped by the sand on the top. Push this down just a little bit to get it onto the column before we put the next batch on. And again, we're catching all the liquid that comes out into our pre-weighed 250 ml beaker. So again, I'm going to stop just shy of letting the solvent line reach my sand layer. I'll continue to add the rest of my ether solution. So that's the last little bit of our ether. We'll put our air hose back in place. Drain it down to the level of the sand before we add our methylene chloride. We'll be adding about 10 mils of our methylene chloride to this to make sure all of our product rinses through the column.
here's our 10 mils of methylene chloride. I'm going to pour that back into my original vessel here, a beaker, just so that if there's any product still remaining, we'll rinse it out. And I'll add this onto the top of the column, just like I did the ether solution. Here's the last little bit of our methylene chloride. Add it into the top of our column. And we'll go ahead and push it through into our catch beaker. Normally, column chromatography is done very slowly. We don't advance the rate the way that we're doing now, but this is uh, an example of flash chromatography. We know that our product is the only compound that's gonna make it through this column, so we can push it through at a higher rate and not have to worry about uh, any contamination in our final beaker. So our solvent is drained down to the top of our sand layer here. We've collected our product in our beaker, pre-weighed. We have a mixture of diethyl ether and methylene chloride. We're going to let this last bit of solvent drop out, and we're going to transfer this over to a hot plate so that we can drive the solvent off and isolate our final product. We've taken our beaker containing our diethyl ether and methylene chloride mixture and our product, and we placed it on a hot plate. We've set that to 40 degrees Celsius, placed it under our snorkel, and we're gonna let our solvents evaporate off into the snorkel system so we can obtain our final product. Let's do a quick recap of our data sheet here. Since we last looked at it, we've added quite a bit of data. We've got a reflux time of approximately 30 minutes. The volume of water that we added before our wash was 10 milliliters. The volume of our diethyl ether used to rinse our spin vane, we didn't use a separate portion. We actually just used the first 10 mil portion of the extraction solvent. The total volume of our diethyl ether extractions was 20 mils, that's two times 10 mil portions. The total volume of our 5% KOH washes was 45 milliliters, that's three 15 mil portions. Total volume of the methylene chloride that we used to rinse our product through the column was approximately 10 milliliters. And then our recovered product, we finished removing our diethyl ether and our methylene chloride from our product. What we're left with is a slightly yellow, transparent, viscous liquid. Okay. We weighed this with our beaker. It came out to be 115.593 grams. We subtracted out the weight of our teared beaker. And that left us with a recovered product weight of 3.159 grams. So that's the, that's the uh, amount that we're going to use to do our percent yield calculations for this experiment. So we're going to take this flask or this beaker over to our IR and our NMR, characterize our final product so we can determine what our starting unknown alkyl bromide was. So we brought our Williamson Ether product over here to the IR. We're going to go ahead and place a drop 
on, we'll do two drops on our diamond window here. We don't need to put the presser arm down, so we've covered our diamond window. We've already taken a background, so we're ready to collect our spectrum. Okay, we'll add this to the window. I'll go ahead and do a fine peaks here so we can get some numbers. We'll go ahead and post this to ELC so you can use both the IR for your product and your starting materials to help you with your lab write-up. Let's move over to the NMR now. We brought our product over to the PicoSpin, our desktop NMR unit. I'm going to go ahead and draw up some of our product here and place it in our Eppendorf tube. plenty for what we need. Set this aside. So we have a liquid this time, so we don't have to worry about dissolving it uh, in deuterated chloroform, but we still have to put in our TMS. Didn't get much in there. Hold on one sec. Alright, there's our TMS, so that's going to give us our standard. this and give it a shake. Now before we inject, of course we've got to push our DI water that's already in the loop. So I'll unscrew my inlet, gently insert my syringe, blow out the water in the loop. We've got our new syringe. draw up our sample. Now of course we've got our air bubble and we need to make sure that we get rid of that. So I'll take a Kim wipe and just push that air bubble out. And we're good. So we're ready to inject. Loosen my inlet, insert the needle, tighten the inlet down, and I'm looking for 10 drops coming out of my outlet hose here. And it could be more than 10 drops. We just want to make sure that we get our loop filled with the sample that we want to analyze. So I'll loosen my inlet, tighten it back down and we're ready to start our scans. We've got this set to eight scans. So I'll go ahead and hit go. Let's see what we've got. Okay. Remember that our first scan, we're at about 12% complete. The first scan is always gonna be a little bit rougher our baseline is a little noisy, but each scan that goes through it will refine itself, will correct some of the phasing issues, and we'll get a clearer and clearer spectrum. So far so good, we're seeing what we expect to see. Seventy-five percent done. And we're complete. So I'll go ahead and zoom in on the part of the spectra that is most important to us, where our peaks are located. We see that we've got some phasing issues here. We're going to correct that uh, within MNOVA, the software that we're going to use to, uh, to analyze these peaks. We're going to set our TMS peak to zero. It's fairly close, but we'll go ahead and set it to zero officially in MNOVA. That will give us all the necessary uh, delta values uh, 
uh, that you recognize from your lecture class. I can see already some very distinctive peaks in this region uh, that are very indicative of the product that we're looking for. So we'll post that up to ELC. You'll go through, identify all the important peaks, and then use that in your lab write-up. Good luck, everybody.